both uh, mom and dad encouraged me to dream. Mm -hmm. That you can be that. You can be a lawyer someday. You can be, you can go to college. You can do this, that you can. Mm -hmm. And that you can attitude, I think, is what kind of has pervaded you know, my life and continues to do that, that I can. You can do that. If you want to do that, you can. As the child of hardworking blue-collar immigrant parents from the Philippines, Big Island-born Brian Andaya took his parents' advice to dream big. These days, Andaya is a role model for other children of immigrant families through his role as Chief Operating Officer of l and Hawaiian Barbecue, which is well established in and outside of Hawaii. Brian Andaya, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Brian Andaya spent his early career as a labor law attorney before being courted by l and franchise CEO Eddie Flores to be second in command of the growing plate lunch chain known as l and Drive-In and l and Hawaiian Barbecue. Andaya had no background in the restaurant business, but his love for all things Hawaii and his ability to relate to people led to his success. As the only child of divorced parents who worked long hours, Andaya learned to be independent at an early age in the plantation communities of Honoka'a and Hilo on Hawaii Island. So I was born in um, Honoka'a, Hawaii, um, on the Big Island. Um, my parents were both from the Philippines. My dad was from uh, Narvakan, Ilocos Norte, for uh, people who um, are familiar. And then my mom was from Pawa Ilocos Norte. Um, and my dad immigrated here when he was, uh, it was 1946. So he was much older than my mom. Um, I think there might have been a 30 or 30 year spread between them. Did she come later? She came later. Um, he worked on the plantations. On, Doing uh, what? What was his job? I think um, it was just general labor. So I know the last job he had was riding around in a truck and planting and, 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 and you know, I don't know, what, what do you call that? Throwing seeds out of the <laughs> truck <laughs> so that the cane would grow. He um, was there for the closure of Hamakua Sugar Company. He was, and I still remember that. It wasn't just a job, it was a way of life that was lost. It was, you know, it, it, was, it was tough. Um, and fortunately by then we were sort of in transition my parents were divorced by then, and so my dad was by himself, and um, so I, I took a lot of, I handled a lot of his affairs. So I kind of knew, and I kind of saw it coming. Um, you know, there was um, a you fair amount of his before. affairs when you were in seventh grade or so. Yeah, you know, I was, I was, um, you know, I was kind of forced to because there was really no one else um, to do it. For example. Um, so his paychecks, I would collect his okay. paychecks and go to the bank for him. Um, if there were bills to pay, um, I'd sort of try to handle some of that. Was there a language difficulty with him? Is oh, that there why? was, there was. So he spoke mostly Ilocano. Do you um, speak Ilocano? I, I do, actually. So he, he depended on you for your language and, and other ability from a, a young age, and so he, he never really learned to communicate in English? He, he yeah, I, I would say yes. Um, he could com communicate on, on a very basic level, but things like, um, you know, even like balancing a checkbook. And then back then it was mostly cash anyway, but yeah, things like that, like he would need help or even reading documents mm -hmm. or what a document meant. And I think perhaps that's one of the factors that influenced me uh, to, be, to get a law degree and become an attorney. I noticed your mom in reading your bio, your mom was a waitress at the big Chinese yes. restaurant in Hilo. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Where yes. everybody goes. Yeah, and yeah. so that meant she always had money in her pocket, right? Because she got tips? Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, for, I'm, I'm really grateful for everything my parents have done. I mean, my mom, um, she worked three jobs to make ends meet. I mean, at that point, it was just she and I at that point. I mean, my, my dad, of course, helped. But I lived with my mom, and I was, you know, I was with my mom, and um, it was very, very difficult to her, for her. And, and she even um, helped my grand, 
uh, grandpa immigrate, who then helped all my uncles and aunties come over from the Philippines and immigrate from the Philippines. And so, and then that was all as I was growing up, and it was all during the divorce and, and all of that. So she worked for, um, she really worked hard for that. Um, so yeah, one of her jobs was at Sunset as a waitress at night. What else did she do? Um, she um, worked at Big Island Candies um, during the day. Um, you know, making, and this is before Big Island Candies was um, a big hit. Mm -hmm. That was before, I think before, I don't even remember them having the short So she had a day you know. job and a night job. So, day and, job, and night job. And you were job. home alone. Oh yeah, so yeah. Um, I'd be home alone. So again, you know, it's that independence. Mm -hmm. um, when my grandfather finally came from the Philippines, then finally I had a, I had someone to watch me, but it was more like, for me, it was more like a buddy. I had someone to talk to, mm -hmm. except he didn't speak any English. That's when you learned. That's when I learned okay. Ilocano. I mean, that's, I mean, talk about immersion, you know? I just either sit in silence or learn, learn how to communicate. And you mentioned your mom had a third job? Yeah, so she worked at the, um, once in a while she'd like, do odd jobs here and there on the weekends, you know? So I, I know at one point she was um, working at the, the factory, the Macadamia Nut Factory, Honolulu Macadamia Nuts. So. so you're on good terms as a, the child of divorce with dad and mom? From my perspective, I don't think there's ever good terms. Um, I wouldn't say it was an ugly divorce, but it definitely wasn't pleasant. And as a child, I remember, and I'm not blaming my parents for this, but you have to choose, you know? It's almost, I, I felt like I had to choose. I had to choose my mom or- and You were the dad. only child too. And I was the only child. And um, I think there was uh, animosity between, the f I mean, of course, mom and dad, but also the families. So I'm really close with my mom's side. Um, and it really was a, the, one of the tougher things that I had to deal with as a kid. Um, it, I think it really had a profound effect on uh, some of the choices I made and what I had to do. And you know, as a father and a husband now, I definitely think about that all the time. And, it really um, shapes um, my, my attitude towards marriage and, and family. Later in his legal career, Brian Adaya would use that ability to deal with conflict and balance priorities. At the time, he continued to split his time with both parents, but lived primarily with his mother in Hilo, Hawaii. Despite little parental supervision, young Brian excelled in school. So I did very well, you know, in... in, in um, Intermediate school, high school, I think early on in high school, ninth, 10th grade, I did, I did quite well. You know, I was on the honor roll, uh, things like that. I was looking at colleges. Um, and then, you know, I think the hormones hit. <laughs> 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 and, you know, it's like, hey, I'm a teenager. And, um, you know, I started hanging around friends, you know, different friends. And we did different things. And we, um, and my grades um, suffered as a result. So right um, at the time you're applying for colleges, right about the time, <laughs> right before that too. So my my choices, my um, choices in terms of colleges and where I went to school were very, very limited. <laughs> well, where'd you go? I went to Portland State University. Um, so it's uh, in Portland, Oregon. Um, I, I had I had a choice to go to UH, UH mm -hmm. Manoa. So they actually um, accepted me, <laughs> um, and I wanted to go there. But um, I I thought to myself, if I go there, I have my friends. You know, and they were a big part of my life at that point. I said, you know, I, I don't know how it's going to be. I, I don't know how it's going to be going to UH Manoa. And, you know, you hear about all of the different parties and all the, you know, which, which I loved, you know. So you I were trying to protect so. yourself <laughs> yeah. from the parties. Yes, yeah, so I said, I, I better go somewhere where I don't know anyone. How was that? It was tough. It was, it was, it was horrible. It was miserable for the first First couple of months, it was miserable. I knew I, I didn't know a single soul in Oregon. Not a single soul. The homesickness never went away. Never ever went away, even, even when I prospered, so to speak, as a, as a student and, and made friends. And I still have you know, friends and will have lifelong friends from college and law school. But the friends didn't take the, the homesickness away. How did you handle it? So like, like, I, th I, like I mentioned, I just did everything I could to be as close to home 
to have Hawaii close to me as much as possible. How did you do that? So, well, I'd, I'd first, you know, remember, I, I don't know a soul, right? So I'd walk around, you know, and say, hey, I think he, she, or she looks like she's from Hawaii. It's like, hey, are you, you from Hawaii by any chance? And, you know, sometimes it's like, no, 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 I'm, you know, in California or whatever. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and finally, I finally bumped into a bunch of, you know, Hawaii people and instantly became friends with them. And, and same thing. So that was one way yeah, mm -hmm. I coped. Um, another way you cope is um, you read the news. And I don't know if this made it worse, but you read the news. Um, uh, I think the internet was first starting. Um, and so you could actually go online and, and get, um, you know, Honolulu Advertiser, whatever it was called Mostly back then. Mostly sunny. Yeah. <laughs> 73 <laughs> and, and, and degrees. Read, you know, and, and, and read the news on, you know, online. Um, do stuff like that. Or, or sometimes I just go to the library and just you know, look up Hawaii books and read about Hawaii and, and really started to embrace things that I never really embraced before, like Hawaiian music. Never liked it. Never, never listened to that. But um, I remember, you know, um, the first time I heard um, CNK and Kalapana, I was, that was it. While attending college in Portland, Oregon, Brian Andaya's newfound appreciation for all things Hawaii would motivate him to reboot the school's Hawaii club. And years later, his love of the culture would inspire him to perform on the ultimate Hawaiian stage. And finally, we got this club going. So we revived it, and um, we decided to have a luau. OK, so we need entertainment for the luau. What's going to be the entertainment? Oh, well, the other schools, they've got the students dancing. I'm like, dancing? Oh, OK. And it was very small. There was only 20 of us. So we were the entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, someone knew how to do the hula. So they kind of taught us, you know? And of course, I'm kind of embarrassed thinking, what kind of perform? I hope nobody has it on, on, on film or <laughs> anything like that. That would, that would be terrible. But I remember, yeah, we, we put on the luau and I, I danced, you know, a couple of numbers. And, and then um, I was going home uh, that summer and I said, I am going to take it up. I'm going to take up the real hula from a real kumu and be part of a halal. And I did that. So I went back to Hilo. I had to work during the summer. There's no other way. But I worked. But I also joined uh, Halau. Kahiki Laulani, um, Ray Fonseca was my mm -hmm. kumu. I did that for the summer. Uh, really liked it. So you okay. made your way to the stage of Mary Monarch? Okay, so you just keep going for the summer. You just mm -hmm. keep going for the summer. And then finally, um, after law school, so this is a few years now, I got a clerkship with Judge Amano. So I was going to be there for a year. I don't know how I did it because um, Judge Amano required a lot of hours <laughs> to be put in, but somehow I, I, I did it um, and um, was one of the most um, fulfilling um, accomplishments I've ever had. What did you dance to? What song? Uh, Kamapua'a was our uh, uh, chant. Which is the pig? Which is the, the, the pig god, and I hope I'm not oversimplifying it. Um, but yeah, that was, that was our chant. Um, I was uh, I was one of um, I think there were five or seven of us. So that was Hula Kahiko, the yeah, Hula Kahiko, hula. and we placed third. The Kahiko placed third, and then overall third. And you know, that's that a was, great accomplishment. Great. Yeah, it was. You know, for a very short time like that. You know, um, nobody thought I could. I I didn't think I could do it. But um, there I was, you know, Mary Monarch Night. And, and it was all because you were homesick in Portland. Yeah, it was all because I'm with. homesick in Portland, you know, and I'm not, I'm not, how, ethnic, you know, I'm not Hawaiian, you know, ethnically speaking. Um, but definitely, uh, definitely Hawaiian at heart. And um, yeah, that was, I was just so proud to uh, be on this stage and represent the Hawaiian culture and be part of the culture. What about the Filipino culture? What does that mean to you? Okay, so that came later. And... Um, yeah, that was tough. That was also tough for me, you know, growing up in um, grade school. There weren't, or I don't remember a lot of Filipinos um, in, in, in my school. Um, I'm sure there were, but, you know, I just don't remember. Or a lot of them, or maybe there were, but they were immigrants that had just immigrated from the Philippines. So it was a little different. Mm -hmm. And so, and then I'd remember, you know, back then it was okay to make these all these jokes and you know put people down and you know 
it was tough for me because growing up, you know, I wanted to fit in. And, um, you know, I really didn't have the confidence or the knowledge then that, hey, you know, you've got to be proud of who you, who you really are. And you've got to represent your culture, your heritage. And nobody, nobody's taught me that. Right? Nobody teaches you that kind of stuff. You know, definitely I didn't get that at home. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until I started my uh, term with uh, Justice Ramil, who was also Filipino. So he introduced me to um, different organizations and really, really and introducing me to some successful Filipinos. And Justice Ramil himself was a huge role model. Like mm -hmm. he was this guy, very similar background, eth ethnically speaking. And he's, you know, as a budding lawyer, that's what you want to become, right? You want to become a Supreme Court justice. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, wow, you know. And then for the first time, I lived on Oahu. And for the first time, there's um, uh, population, uh, Filipino population in, in enough concentration where you can relate to people. Brian Andaya says the world didn't beat a path to his door after he graduated from law school. But after several law clerkships, including one with Hawaii Supreme Court Justice Mario Ramil, Brian Andaya began practicing law, which led to a fortuitous introduction to Eddie Flores, the CEO of LNL Drive-In. The two men hit it off, and the business chemistry would start Andaya down a much different road. I actually met Eddie because Justice Ramil introduced me to um, the Filipino JCs, and then um, I happened to meet Eddie at a party, <laughs> who said, "Hey, you know what? What do you do?" I said, "I'm a lawyer." You know, and you know, I was uh, maybe not even a year in practice, maybe six, seven months in. in and what kind practice. of law practice were you? I was doing, doing labor law, labor law already. Okay. So I have a problem. So I said, "I do labor law." So he said, oh, I've got a problem, you know, I'm this X, Y, Z. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can help you with that. It's the answer is this, you know. And it was a it, between, I mean, it was an easy one. It wasn't a very tough problem, you know, the way I saw it. But, you know, um, so he did. He sent the cases over and um, we disagreed, you know. Um, I said, well, this is what it is. And he said, no, I disagree. I want a second opinion. And you know, yeah, I, was a, I was a new lawyer, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I said, yeah, go ahead and get it. And he eventually came back and said, okay, you're, you're right. And then what happened? I mean, you, how did you make it to COO? Um, and then, you know, that kind of, I, I think that, uh, I think, bought a lot of trust. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm not just one that if I'm hired, if I'm, you know, hired to do a job, I'll do my job. And it's not, a lot of times, one of the worst things you can do as a professional is to be a yes person, a yes, and to say yes to everything, because you're really doing a disservice to your client and to, to, to the, your organization. And so I think he kind of knew that, hey, okay, this guy's going to be honest with me. When Eddie asked you to come and join in a leadership position at l and um, that was a wonderful invitation, but it didn't mean you'd be successful. How did you make a success of it? You know, I knew that it was um, life-changing. Um, I mean, it's, you know, at first it was like, can I practice law on the side? Like, no, you gotta, you know, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta focus on l and you know, you, you can't serve two masters. Um, and then I go, well, what does a CEO, what is a COO, what does that do? <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> I don't know anything. Um, about being a COO. And the LNL had not had a COO previously? No. So you're the first. Yes. And I said, I can't cook, I can't you know, be in the kitchen, um, I'm horrible, well, what am I supposed to do? So about, a lot of it is about you know, figuring it out. Figuring it out um, what a COO role does, and then of course it has to be specific to that organization. And his daughter is the CFO, so you've yep. got family on either side of you. Yep, and she's, she's the one that's good with spreadsheets and numbers and everything else like that, so I'm really happy that she's around. Um, but no, it's, um, again, figuring out, um, putting yourself in the shoes of um, the people who rely on you. So the people in the office, in, the, in our corporate office. What is it they need from my position, from me? Um, the people out in the in the stores, the franchisees, our clients, what, what do they need? What is it 
that I can do to be, of, to be as useful as I can to them. And all the way down to the, to the employees, that, um, the line employees on the, the cook line, uh, the cashiers, what is it they need? How can I best serve their interest? And really that takes a little while to figure out. Um, certainly one thing I learned from the very beginning is that it's impossible, no matter what your title is, no matter, how, even, even if you're the owner, if, if you've got an organization that's got an established culture, um, corporate culture I'm talking about, you can't just come in overnight and, and change it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you chose to think about what other people need from you. You could have said, I gotta look at what I need from these people. Oh, absolutely. It's never, it can't be, to be an effective leader, it can, it's not about you. You know, it, it can't be about you. Because really it's, it's, about the it's about the organization that you're serving or the company that you're serving or the people that your constituents. It's about them. Um, you've been put in a position or I've been put in a position um, um, to make choices and to you know, for the best interest of the organization. And I take any leadership role um, uh, with the same attitude, whether it be for a nonprofit or, um, or, or my, my kids um, swimming club. Brian Andaya's ability to relate to people helped him gain traction in his new role as the Chief Operating Officer of l and In 2011, Pacific Business News named him the Young Business Leader of the Year. These days, and this conversation is taking place in 2016, Andaya frequently finds himself in the air and on the road with nearly 200 l &Ls to oversee. Literally, we're from um, New York, New York State, to Malaysia and Indonesia. Well, I would say that's a pretty vast, uh, pretty long, um, uh, it's, it's a lot of miles between them, and all, all in between, up to Alaska, uh, Japan, Philippines. How uh, many is that? How many stores? We've got a total of 200 now. And how many, what are you aiming for? Uh, is there a goal? Well, it depends who you ask, but if you ask me, in my position, it's 500, 1,000, you know, I mean, I think sky's the limit. You know, I, I don't think there's any limit on, or any set goal in terms that we should, okay, let's reach for. Most immediately, I think, um, uh, because you always have to set a short-term goal, I think most immediately if we can um, maybe grow two or three per month, um, I think that would be great. That sounds like it's a very intensive job since you're the chief of operations. It is very intensive. It, it's very in intensive, but what, what I like is that because I'm passionate about it, because it's about Hawaii, and because it's about helping um, immigrants like my, my family and um, myself to some extent. Is that who a lot of the franchisees yes, are? Yes, yes. Almost everyone are immigrants, and a lot of the workers are Immigrants. And not always Filipino immigrants. No, no, not always Filipino. Actually, um, in Hawaii, it's mostly um, you know, Chinese. Um, there's some Filipino um, uh, franchisees on the mainland, but uh, and, 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 and in Korean and Vietnamese, you know, we got a whole mix and Indian. But really, I identify I identify with them because they're just like my family. Mm -hmm. They came to America for you know to in search of a better life, and um, having a business. And uh, something I wish I had, you know, early on, and something I wish my family had early on, is is a means to that. So uh, to this, to the extent that I can help them achieve their goals and achieve their dreams, I'm I'm really playing out, you know, what I want for my family. And what's your ultimate dream, or are you living it? I I think I'm living it, but um, I think um, of course the natural pro progression would be um, to become you know, CEO of, of l and um, to be able to provide even better for my children and my, my family, to be able to have um, freedom at some point, financial freedom, so that I can do what I want to do, um, really, really want to do on my terms. Um, I am very fortunate to be where I'm at and to uh, be, you know, in, in this place. Um, I, I'm... Number one, I'm, I'm home. I'm in Hawaii, and so there's very little that can go wrong the way I see it. <laughs> um, just being here is, is something I appreciate a lot. I've got a family, I've got my wife, and I've got my kids. I've, that's, 
that's everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, I'm very fortunate enough I've got Eddie, um, Eddie Flores, who has allowed me to pursue this opportunity with l and And every day I wake up and I know that my, I can pursue my passion is really to spread Hawaii, the spirit of aloha throughout the world. And I actually get to do that. Brian Andaya continues to spread the aloha spirit through the local plate lunch, as well as with his involvement and leadership in community organizations like the Filipino Community Center and the Filipino Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii. He's tied in with political leadership too. In 2013, U.S. Senator Brian Schatz picked Andaya to serve as one of his five field representatives to help identify the concerns and needs of Hawaii constituents. Mahalo to Brian Andaya of Honolulu for sharing your story with us. And thank you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha, hui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. I always like to read Dr. Seuss, and there's a book called um, Oh, The Places You Go. And I read that, and it reminds me of my life. But I think it's all about marveling at things. Marveling at things, and it talks about ups and downs. It talks about dreaming, and it talks about dreaming of the places that you want to go or the things that, and, and it's a kind of an allusion to the things that you want to have or, or things in your life that you wish were part of your life.